or we're continuing our series on a closer look at 12 Ordinary Men. And I actually should almost change the name of the series, so I won't do that for our, all of our statisticians that are having a fit hearing this. I won't do it until the end of the series. But I'm thinking about changing the name of it to add something to the effect of, I don't know, a closer look at the 12, 12 Ordinary Men and the effect it has on our lives. Because throughout this whole entire series, that's what we've been doing, you know, putting them in juxtaposition to ourselves. So it's not just about we're talking about 12 little men and that's it. Um, there's a lot more that's coming as a result of it. So whatever, we'll think about it. That's up to the Holy Spirit. He'll make it clear. So the last time we were together, we were talking about and we were finishing up about our little guy, or I shouldn't call him little guy, he could have been like eight feet tall for all I know, Andrew. And Andrew, we knew, was someone who was very zealous when it came to the things of God. We even talked about how um, one of the things that he had done was he actually had led the wife of a provincial Roman governor to Christ. Because as we know, Andrew liked to bring everybody to Jesus. That's what he, that's what he was known for. And this particular woman, he brought her to Christ and it infuriated her husband. She was just, he was extraordinarily upset about it and wanted her to just denounce everything when it came to the Lord and just forget everything and she refused to do it. So he, as a result, the husband as a result of that decided to go ahead and crucify Andrew because he was just that angry. And he was really kind of mean-spirited, well, obviously, if he was going to crucify the man. But on top of it, instead of letting him just be crucified like the normal crucifixion, you know, that sounds bad, where they're nailing you, he actually just allowed them to use lashes, which was known as ropes or cords, because that's even more, you suffer more that way, supposedly. Then on top of that, if that wasn't bad enough, he used a saltir, which is a cross that instead of the traditional cross that we know, it was like formed as an X to really just stretch the man out. He just was, oh, he did everything he could to make Andrew just suffer. But what was Andrew's reaction to that? Which I always thought was very interesting. Instead of Andrew, you know, like how, think about this. This is how, again, we can put it in juxtaposition to ourselves. We have a challenge. What do we do? Do we see the outside of it? Do we see outside of the challenge to the end result? Or do we just kind of like bellyache right there in the middle of the challenge? You know, we tend to do that. We murmur and complain, and woe is me, and why is the Lord allowing this to happen to me? I don't understand. I'm born again. I'm spirit filled. I should not have a challenge. You know, we go through all that. Here's Andrew in a saltier cross, like an X. Just think about that. And he's suffering, but at the same time, he's choosing to still lead people to Christ. As people are passing by, because that's the other thing that this <laughs> Roman did that was just so mean. He put him out on public display. He wanted people to see this. He was trying to make a statement. And what did Andrew do? He sat there, and as the people were passing by, he was still telling them the good news of Jesus. He was still leading people to Christ. And here we are. We don't have any challenges at all. We can sit up in a five-star restaurant if we choose, and we still won't open our mouths. It's definitely something that gives you pause and truly makes you think. So when you think about Andrew, you realize that that was what he was really technically known for. But was he slighted? Could you say that he was considered slighted? No. Actually, he was very privileged. He was the first, when you think about it, to hear that Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was the first to follow Christ. He was part of the inner circle, that, and he was given intimate access to Christ. So that right there means that there's no way, shape, or form we should feel sorry for the man. I mean, but his name, and this is the other thing, and this is something we can learn from. His name will be inscribed along with the names of the other apostles on the foundations of the eternal city, the New Jerusalem. The point here is it doesn't matter if you see one of your brothers or sisters in Christ that seem to be doing something more magnanimous than you. That's not the point. The point is that you do what your purpose is, what God has called you to do, and recognize that you're going to get the same result. You're going to get the same credit, if you will, 
God is going to look at you and, and be able to realize and recognize that you did what I called you in the earth realm to do. That is far more important than what anybody else is going to say about you. And that's the thing that was so special about Andrew. We need more people, really, when you think about it, like him. They're the quiet individuals, laboring faithfully but inconspicuously, giving insignificant sacrificial gifts. Those are the ones who accomplish the most for the Lord. They don't receive much recognition, but they don't seek it either. <laughs> and that's what I think I've always appreciated so much about intercessors, true intercessors, because they're the people who are behind the scenes. Sometimes people don't even recognize or notice that they exist, but the differences that they make in what's happening in people's lives every day. That's what's so important. And that's the type of person Andrew was. The only thing people like Andrew and people that are just willing to do what God has called them to do and do it inconspicuously, they just want to hear the master say, well done. And that, when you think about it, that is what we should be really living for. And Andrew's legacy is the example he left to show us that in effective ministry, it's often the little things that count, the individual people, the insignificant gifts, and the inconspicuous service. It's the things that you wouldn't even imagine that go on behind the scenes. You know, so often now, most of us here, a lot of you are in Ministry of Helps. So you know full well what goes on before a service starts. Because many of you get here at like 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning for a service that starts with praise and worship at 9.45. The average person that just comes in has never been in Ministry of Helps. They just come in and plop down and just think that, you know, all of this just happened. No, it did not. There's a lot that went in behind the scenes, a lot that went on behind the scenes. And I don't know, it's when you can get a glimpse of it and you understand it, there's nothing more gratifying than being able to see. You know, just like I sit and think about, we just went on this trip to the Museum of the Bible and everybody got here. I, this trip was the best on so many levels. First of all, it was the best because everybody did what they were asked to do exactly as they were asked to do it, with no exception. That, okay, we've been around for what, 18 years now? That's the first time that I know of that that's ever happened. So to me, that was like a home run. We hit it out of the park. Everybody showed up on time. There was no grumbling, murmuring, or complaining. Everybody paid everything on the due date like they were supposed to. It was just beautiful. But now, some of the things that went on behind the scenes, nobody knew that Stan was up until after midnight packing up those beautiful little goodie bags everybody took, you know, because that's something that happens behind the scenes. Or making sure that everything is ordered to put in, you know, all of those little things. They're inconspicuous. But it makes a difference because everybody's happy when they get the end result. So it's the same thing with all of us. Everything that we do, if you're calling up a friend and you're asking them, is there something you want me to get into agreement with you about? Is everything OK? Now, I don't mean you just sit there and go through your Rolodex and go, well, not that they have that anymore, but go on your phone and just go down the list. Do as you're led. Make it purpose in your heart to pray for your friends. That's what we're supposed to do. And then sometimes somebody will come up in your spirit. Call them, check on them, find out. That can make a tremendous difference. But you know what? It's making more of a difference for you than it is even for them. Because what you're doing for them, you're planting that seed, which means what? You're going to get the harvest of it, and there will be a day that someone calls you and returns that same care and love and favor. And I, I just think that that's wonderful. So anyway, do me a favor. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. And because God really delights in such things that I've just been talking about and the way in which Andrew lived his life. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 27 through 29. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27 through 29. I'm going to share it with you first out of the Amplified because, of course, I love the qualifiers. And it says, but God has selected, this is what it means, for his purpose 
the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, revealing their ignorance. And God has selected for his purpose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, revealing their frailty. God has selected for his purpose the insignificant base things of the world and the things that are despised and treated with contempt, even the things that are nothing, so that he might reduce to nothing the things that are, so that no one may be able to boast in the presence of God. I just absolutely really like that. The expanded Bible puts it this way. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose what the world thinks is unimportant, insignificant, lowly. And what the world looks down on, despises, and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important, something special. God did this so that no one can brag, boast in his presence. And lastly, I really appreciate this translation, which is why I want to share it out of the message. And it says, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose those nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. And when you really stop and think about that, that is so completely true. Because it doesn't matter what type of life you had before you accepted Jesus. All that you did that was not correct was thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. You are given a clean slate and you can move forward from that. There is nothing as special as that or more precious than that. Now, of the three disciples, in Jesus' closest inner circle, James is the least familiar to us because that's the next person we're going to start talking about in case you wonder. Now, the biblical account is practically devoid of any explicit details about his life and character. He never appears as a standalone character in the gospel accounts. That's very interesting. But he's always paired with his younger and better known brother, John. Now, I just thought this was so interesting, because they always paired these two brothers, and it seemed as if one brother was always more prominent than the other one. I'm like, OK, but whatever. So in this particular case, that's the case. The only time he is mentioned by himself happens to be in the book of Acts. And that's where his martyrdom is recorded. So if you look at Acts, the 12th chapter, and you look at verses 1 and 2, you'll see that. So I'm going to share it with you first out of the New International Version, Acts 12, verses 1 and 2. And it says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now, if we look at it in the Amplified, it says pretty much the same thing. Now, at that time, Herod, Agrippa I, the king of the Jews, arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to harm them. And he and James, the brother of John, had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. If we look at it in the message, eh, it gives a little bit more information. That's when King Herod got, in, <laughs> got it into his head to go after some of the church members. He murdered James, John's brother. When he saw how much it raised his popularity, this is interesting, raiding with the Jews, he actually arrested Peter. All this during Passover week, mind you, and had him thrown in jail, putting four squads of four soldiers each to guard him. He was planning a public lynching after Passover. So that lets us get even a better glimpse of King Herod and what he was all about. 
Now this relative silence about James is really ironic because from a human perspective, he might have seemed the logical one, the most logical one to dominate the group. Between James and John, James was the eldest. Now, how do we know that? It's presumed so because his name always appears first when the two brothers appear together. Now we can just think about that. If you have uh, siblings, okay? Um, like say for instance, I have five children. So if I'm ever gonna talk about my eldest, my two oldest girls, because I have two girls and two boys and then you know my baby girl, I would say Argerita and Tiffany, because Argerita is the eldest. I wouldn't say Tiffany and Argerita. I mean, it just doesn't, and that's in most families. You always usually say the eldest name first. So, okay, just using that, that makes sense. So that's why all the time their names appear that way. And between the two sets of brothers, the family of James and John seems, they're a little bit different too because they seem to be a little bit more prominent than the family of Peter and Andrew. See, it's interesting when you start getting into the backstories and start getting into their family to see, you know, why were they treated a certain way or what seemed different about them. Now, this is hinted by the fact that James and John are often referred to simply as the sons of Zebedee. Okay, now we know that, right? So this is where you're going to have to do a little work. Okay, so go with me to Matthew's Gospel, and we're going to look at the 20th chapter and the 20th verse. And you're going to be in Matthew for a little bit, so it's okay. So we'll look at Matthew 20, verse 20, in the New King James Version. And it says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, him meaning Jesus, with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him. The Amplified says, now this I thought was interesting. Then Salome, now, just this is, I'm going to press the pause button here. Because this has nothing to do with this. But Salome, you always hear me pronounce it as Salome, right? Okay. I then looked at this movie, which I'll tell you about later, and they pronounce it Salome. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> okay? Because I am very particular about when there is a word, I go through finding out the pronunciation, the biblical pronunciation, and I was like, wait a minute, I have been saying Salome for years, and now you're gonna tell me it's Salome? Then I found out it could be either or. So I just bring that up, so when you hear me say Salome, it's okay, it's not like I'm saying it wrong, okay? It is correct, all right. So, then Salome, the mother of Zebedee's children, James and John, came up to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down in respect, asked a favor of him. And then we just see the same thing in the message, okay? The brothers came with her two, I mean, she came with her two sons and knelt before Jesus with the request. Now that's something interesting too that we can talk about a little later because some people think that these boys, because I remember someone asking me, was John the youngest of the apostles? Technically, from all that I could dig up, he is considered that. Some people mark him at being about 24. Some people mark him at being about 20. And then some say that these two brothers were actually teenagers. So I guess we can take our pick of whatever we like. Either way, they were kind of young. But they also conclude that they were a little young because the fact that their Jewish mother was taking them to see Jesus and asking the request, meaning if they would have been strapping 35-year-old men, their Jewish mom wouldn't have been taking them. So that's the other reason. You know, so some things we don't have the complete 100% answer, so we just have to kind of go with the flow and, you know, I don't know really how big of an importance it is. We can say that they were young. Let's just look at it that way. Okay, so you're already in Matthew. Turn over to the 26th chapter. Just go to Matthew 26. And we're going to look at verses 37 and 38. And in the New King James Version, it says, And he, meaning Jesus, took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. 
And in the Amplified, it says, in taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, he began to be grieved and greatly distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and stay awake and keep watch with me. And in the message, then Jesus went with them to a garden called Gethsemane and told his disciples, stay here while I go over there and pray. Take along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. He plunged into an agonizing sorrow. Then he said, this sorrow is crushing my life out. Stay here and keep vigil with me. Now, this again is another sidebar, um, but it meant a lot to me when I read it. And I, I mean, I read it several times and I still come up with the same thing. So that's the only reason why I'm going to share it. We are living in a time right now, I mean, I have seen in the last, since Sunday, probably three or four different little clips on talk shows and news things where the spirit of depression is like hovering in the earth realm. The millennials forget it. They are dealing with anxiety and depression because they don't understand what some of us who are over 25 understand, that you do have to work, and it's not that you really like your work all the time, but you do it as a means to an end, because you do have to pay bills. And a lot of them don't understand because they got out of college, they got these degrees, everybody told them they were going to be wonderful, and they get out of college with these degrees, and then they try to you know, <laughs> laugh at the degrees. I <laughs> just say, well, you have to do like your parents did, which means you got to work, you may not like your job, and guess what? You get to pay bills. They are just like, what are you talking? It's foreign to them. They don't understand it. Meaning it's like, why do we do this? So for them, some of them get very sorrowful. And it's, it's real, okay, so we're not negating it, but even people who are older, and, and you know, I mean, I remember when I was a child, which I know is like 100 years ago, but I remember when I was a child, we looked up to people who were older, but they had wonderful lives. Like they retired and they just sat and talked to their friends. It was just so different. Now people are older and they're like 75 working at Walmart. Now I mention and give Walmart the plug because Walmart at least will still hire them. Because when you're 75, some people, even though we're not supposed to have any kind of age discrimination, it's a lie. They're there is age discrimination, and they won't, but Walmart at least will. But the fact that somebody has to be 75, 80, 85, working every day just so that they can pay for whatever their needs happen to be, that to me is horrific. But that's where we live. So you will have sometimes people who are in that age group who are also struggling with feeling sorrowful, feeling distressed, feeling anxious, feeling depressed. Don't make the mistake, as I know sometimes Christians have a tendency to do, is to judge them and make them feel less than. Because none of us, I don't care who you are, are better than the Lord. And what does it say that we just read? The Lord, he was, I mean, this is God himself, okay? He knew what he was about to face. How did he feel? He felt sorrowful. He felt distressed. He was not having a good day. But here is the thing, and this is what we can do and encourage not only ourselves, but our brethren who are having a time of distress or depression or discouragement. We can encourage them to do what Jesus did. And this was the part that just shined like a beacon to me. He knew, and we hear all the time, that God is what? He is everything. We are branches of that. So you don't ever want a vine or a branch to be disconnected from the base of everything or the base of the tree. So what did Jesus do? He set himself apart to go pray because he knew where his strength was coming from. He knew where everything that he needed he knew he already had it, he was the son of God, but he wanted to go and have that fellowship. And that's what 
we need to always do. And we need to encourage people to do the same. And it doesn't mean that we're beating them over the head and making them feel bad. You usher them into it. That could just be that little text message or that little call with just a word that you're giving them to encourage them, to make them realize, you know what? You are loved, you are valued. Whatever it is that you are walking through right now, it has come to pass. It is not going to stay here and you can get to the other side. I just thought that was just so beautiful. And we just kind of like read over that scripture and just go on to the next one. So that's why I spent time with that. So hopefully it helped somebody. I know that it helped me when I read it. So now you're in Matthew, just go right over now to the 27th chapter. I told you this would be easy. You're all in Matthew, so it's very good. So go to Matthew 27, and we're gonna look at verses 55 and 56. And the New King James says, and many women who follow Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there looking on from afar. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and it should be Joseph. This says, jo this has got to be, yeah, this is weird the way this is. And the mother of Zebedee's sons. And then, excuse me, yeah, it's actually a misprint. Can you imagine? This is actually a misprint. That's interesting. I don't usually, when I um, print these out, edit them because they're scripture. Why should I edit it? It says, the mother of James and Joseph, like Moses. That's literally what this says. Okay. Well, over in the Amplified, it says, there were also many women there looking on from a distance who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and the mother of James and Joseph and Salome, the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John. And then pretty much we're seeing the same thing in the message, so I'm not even gonna really read it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, okay, the only thing that I will say is when they talk about, if you look back at the Amplified, they're speaking of, in verse 56, this particular apostle is known as James the Less or James the Younger, which I think I had shared with you earlier before because we get that reference actually back in Mark's Gospel. So that again is pointing to the fact that the Sons of Thunder were definitely young men. They were not as old as or seasoned as perhaps some of the other apostles. Now I need you to turn to Mark's gospel and we're gonna look at the 10th chapter, Mark 10. And we're gonna look at verses 35 through 37. Mark 10, verses 35 through 37. And this is the New King James Version. It says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, meaning Jesus, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in glory. Hmm. Now the Amplified says, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he replied to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant that we may sit with you, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory, your majesty and splendor, in your kingdom. Hmm. And the message says, they said, teacher, we have something we want you to do for us. What is it? I'll see what I can do. Arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory, one of us at your right and the other at your left. Now this is telling us quite a bit about these two young men. Don't they sound like they felt as if they were somewhat privileged? Because I mean, how do you go up to the Lord now? And you are gonna, you, they recognize he is the Messiah. They are following him and they have the audacity to go up and start telling him that they want the highest honor to sit with him. I mean, I thought that was like, we talk about certain privileges, that was <laughs> very, very interesting. Now, this next scripture is gonna show us where Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee with people crowding around him listening to the word of God. And he saw two boats lying at the water's edge with fishermen standing by washing their nets because we, we have visited this before. Jesus got into one of the boats, it was of course Simon Peter's boat, and asked him to put out a little distance from the shore. He began teaching from the boat. When he finished speaking, he instructed Peter 
to proceed into the deep water and lower his nets to catch fish. Now, of course, Simon didn't like the idea and voiced his opinion, but he still chose to be obedient. Now, earlier on in the series, we talked about why Peter really didn't want to do it. They had been up all night, they hadn't caught anything, and they also knew that the right time to catch fish was not this time that Jesus was asking them to go do it. So he was kind of thinking, this makes no sense, but he still, we gotta give him credit that he still chose to be obedient. And as we know, they caught so many fish that they actually had to signal to their partners in the other boat to come help them because it was just too much for them. And Peter was so remorseful, he was quite remorseful, and he fell down at Jesus' knees declaring himself to be a sinful man. And why was he a sinful man? Because he doubted what Jesus had said. That should really pull at our heartstrings, because if the word of God, which is the same thing as Jesus saying to us, says that we have every single one of our needs met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, why do we spend one second worrying about how we're going to pay for something? As long as we are doing what we're supposed to Now, I'm not saying you sit home on the couch with bonbons looking at movies all day. That's not what I mean. But if you are going out, and because if man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. So if you're going out and you are having some type of work that you're setting your hand to, then you have to believe that God is going to give you the increase and he's going to meet the need and everything is going to be taken care of because he promised. So why would we be concerned with that. Or if you go to the doctor and he gives you some kind of report that definitely does not line up with the word, the word is truth. So who are you going to believe? The report that the doctor gives you or the truth of the word? Don't be concerned. Do what you're supposed to do now. I mean, I mean I'm not telling you to be ridiculous and just abandon the knowledge that the doctors can help you with things. Do that, but don't fret over it. Because when you do that, that's not operating in faith. That's operating in fear. Fear is what? False evidence appearing real and if you start operating in that that's right where the enemy wants you and you are not going to achieve the promises of God because we know that faith is what the currency of the kingdom so that's something that we also always always have to remember so turn with me to Luke Luke's gospel and we're gonna look at the fifth chapter verses 9 through 11 and I always, again, give you all these scriptures because I'm not standing up just giving you like a report of things that I heard. I want you to see it for yourself. Because guess what? You can go with this huge book. <laughs> if you go to the, that would be really interesting. You could go to the next family reunion. <laughs> For all those people who don't want to accept Jesus, tell them, well, don't do that. Never mind. <laughs> it's okay. You're going to have to read all that. No, don't do that. Because I actually know somebody who would. Do not do that. Anyway, so Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter. If we look at verses 9 through 11, I'm going to share it out of the Amplified. It says, for he and all his companions were completely astounded at the catch of fish. And when they're talking about he, they're talking about Peter at the catch of fish, fish which they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon Peter. Jesus said to Simon, have no fear. From now on, you will be catching men. After they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him and following his example. Um, the same thing pretty much happened in well, no, I will read this because I like it better. In the message, Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell to his knees before Jesus. Master, leave. I'm a sinner and can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. When they pulled in that catch of fish, awe overwhelmed Simon and everyone with him. It was the same with James and John, Zebedee's sons, co-workers with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, there is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled their boats up on the beach, left them nets and all, and followed him. There was no, they had no doubt, they knew that they wanted to go ahead and follow him. Now turn with me to John's Gospel, the 21st chapter, and this is going to be quick. This is just verse 2. John 21, verse 2. In the New King James Version, it says, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, 
Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Now the message says, after this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples, this time at the Tiberias Sea, the Sea of Galilee. This is how he did it. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the brothers Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing. And we already know the story of why he did that, but we're going to leave it there. All that we have read, because we just read a lot, shows us that Zebedee was considered a man of some kind of importance because they were always referring back to the sons of Zebedee. So there had to be something going on with Zebedee. So let's find out. Zebedee's prestige might have stemmed from his financial success, his family lineage, or maybe both. He was apparently well-to-do. Here's why. His fishing business was large enough to employ multiple hired servants. So it wasn't just like these poor little people out there on the boat by themselves. And we can tell this, I can back it up, turn with me to Mark. Go to Mark's Gospel, I told you, you have to work a little tonight. <laughs> Go to Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, verse 20. The Amplified Bible says this, immediately Jesus called to them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers and went away to follow him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him, and following his example. If we look at it in the message, it says, a dozen yards or so down the beach, he saw the brothers James and John, Zebedee's sons. They were in the boat mending their fishnets. Right off, he made the same offer. Immediately late, they left their father Zebedee, the boat, and the hired hands, and followed. Hmm, okay. So another point is that Zebedee's entire family had enough status that the Apostle John was known to the high priest. Remember when we learned earlier how Peter wanted to find out what was happening to the Lord? He wanted to know, he wanted to know he was okay. This was the night that he was betrayed. And they had to go to the high priest's home. That's where Jesus was. And they didn't know Peter from anybody. Okay, but they knew John. Why did they know John? Okay, that was something very interesting. Okay, because John was the one that was able to get Peter admitted into the high priest's courtyard on the night of Jesus' arrest. In other words, if it wouldn't have been for John, Peter wouldn't have gotten in. Now, how do we know this? Go to the book of John. Go to John's Gospel, the 18th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 15 and 16. And in the Amplified Bible, it says, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Now that disciple was known to the high priest. So he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the residence of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the door. So the other disciple, John, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter inside. So that was the only way that he could really get in. So the Message Bible says Simon Peter, Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. That other disciple was known to the chief priest, and so he went in with Jesus to the chief priest's courtyard. Peter had to stay outside. Then the other disciple went out, spoke to the doorkeeper, and got Peter in. There is some evidence that Zebedee was a Levite and closely related to the high priest's family. Whatever the reason, though, for Zebedee's prominence, it is clear from scripture that he was a man of importance and his family's reputation reached from Galilee all the way to the high priest's household in Jerusalem. So that said something about him, which is why obviously these two brothers were a little bit in a different station, if you want to call it, I guess, than Peter and Andrew. James, as the elder brother from such a prominent family, might have felt that by all rights, he ought to be the chief apostle. <laughs> Again, he had, you know, we sit up and we talk about how some people have certain privileges. Well, you could see all through this when you study, these boys felt like they deserved something and that they had some kind of privilege, okay? They really did. Indeed, that may be one of the main reasons when you think about it, that there were so many disputes among the apostles as to which 
of them should be considered the greatest. Okay, and it definitely started with these brothers because they really thought <laughs> that they were extra special. And if you look over at, if you turn real quickly to Luke's Gospel, the 22nd chapter, and you know, you know what, you can just mark it down because we've gone over it before. That's when we talk about how they're fighting again about who's the greatest. That's just in case you don't remember, it's Luke 22, 24. So you can just jot that down. But James, never did actually take first place among the apostles except in one regard. He became the first to be martyred. Hmm. James is a much more significant figure than we really might consider based on the little that we know about him because there's not a whole lot written about him. In two of the list of apostles, his name comes immediately after Peter's. It seems to happen that way. We can prove that if you go to Mark's gospel the third chapter, we'll look at verses 16 through 19. Mark 3, verses 16 through 19, and I'm only going to share it out of the message. It says, he climbed a mountain and invited, he meaning Jesus, climbed a mountain and invited those he wanted with him. They climbed together. He settled on 12 and designated them apostles. The plan was that they would be with him and he would send them out to proclaim the word and give them authority to banish demons. These are the 12. Simon, Jesus later named him Peter, meaning rock. James came right after, okay, son of Zebedee. John, brother of James, Jesus nicknamed the Zebedee brothers Bonerges, which we'll talk about later, meaning sons of thunder. And then it goes on with Andrew, Peter, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and then Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So the point is, he must have had some kind of importance if his name came directly after Peter, okay? So there's a good reason to assume that he was a strong leader and probably second in influence after Peter. Now, of course, James also figures prominently in the close inner circle of three because it was he Peter and John were the only ones Jesus permitted to go with him when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Now that says a lot, okay? And that you can find, all right, you're already in Mark, just turn over really quickly to the fifth chapter of Mark, and you can look at verse 37. And I'm gonna share it with you out of the message. You can always look at it in the other translations because they're all good, but the message kind of puts it right where we need it. And it says, he permitted no one to go in with him except Peter, James, and John. They entered the leader's house and pushed their way through the gossips looking for a story and neighbors bringing in casseroles. Can you imagine? Okay. Jesus was abrupt. Why all these busybody grief and gossip? Hmm, I thought that was interesting. This child isn't dead. She's sleeping. Provoked to sarcasm, they told him, he didn't know what he was talking about. Now, this again, we can learn from this. When you are in the midst of a storm, you don't need a whole bunch of people bringing casseroles and busybodies around in your life, okay? That's why sometimes when you are walking through something that's a challenge, unless you know that you have a prayer warrior who is really going to be in agreement with you and can keep their lips zipped, don't bother. You go directly to the throne room of God, and you stay in fellowship with God and pray in the Holy Spirit when you don't even know what else to pray for, and then you can share the victory after you have overcome whatever the challenge is. You have to be very careful, but we see this all the time. So it's put in here for us to learn from, and I think Jesus gives a, a perfect example that all of us can learn from when it comes to that. So this same group of three witnessed Jesus' glory also on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now I need you to turn to Matthew's Gospel, the 17th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. I'm going to share it out of the message. First, I was going to read it out of the Amplified, but the message is a little bit stronger. And it says, six days later, three of them saw that glory. Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out right before their eyes. Sunlight poured through his face. His clothes were filled with light. Then they realized that Moses and Elijah were also there in deep conversation with him. 
he was included again. I mean, if you think that wasn't even enough, okay? Uh, James was among four disciples who questioned Jesus privately on the Mount of Olives. And that you can see if you, just all you need to really do is turn to Mark's gospel. And we're gonna look at, yeah. We're gonna look at verse, I mean chapter 13, verses three and four. So Mark 13, verses three and four. And I'll share it with you first out of the Amplified, and it says, And he, meaning Jesus, was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be fulfilled? If we look at it in the message, it just says, Later, as he was sitting on Mount Olives in full view of the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew got him off by himself and asked, tell us when this is going to happen. What sign will we get that things are coming to a head? Now this kind of lets us know a little bit about them too. We can be that way sometimes. You know, when we're waiting for the answer to a prayer, we really want to know, okay, Lord, well, when is this going to happen? When is it going to manifest? Why am I waiting so long? But see, now here's the distinct difference. They, it is true, got to walk with Jesus, but we have Jesus within us. So it should really, we should be able to rest even easier because if the whole entire Godhead is within us, working on our behalf, okay, then there's no reason why we should be unsettled in any way, shape, or form. We just know that we just have to rest in him. I mean, it should be very simple. So this scripture to me kind of puts us in remembrance of that and helps us remember that that's exactly what we need to do. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.